In this online lecture, the excitement continues as we are still in the early medieval period, but we now are moving on to the Carolingian period. So the previous lecture that you listened to, or perhaps you heard this in class, uh, we looked at the artwork produced in the Saxon period, and we noted that in that period the art is characterized as being primarily small scale. and found primarily in churches as well as burial sites. Now we attributed this type of artwork production to the fact that in the Saxon period in this region of Europe, which is formerly the western region of the Roman Empire, that they did not have a centralized political system that would result in the commissioning of large-scale works, particularly of architecture. Now things change in the Carolingian period. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. I have a few examples of work from the Carolingian period. And then in a separate lecture, um, perhaps online or in class, depending on which class you're taking, uh, we will look at art produced in the Etonian period. Now I will just say really quick, uh, you'll note that the Carolingian period is rather short, uh, approximately 43 years. Um, and that is due to um, some dynastic infighting that happens at the end of the period. Now, in terms of the Carolingian period, okay, this is named after the um, Emperor Charlemagne. And um, what happened is, is Charlemagne, he came into power, and uh, he marked the first time since the fall of Rome that we see centralized power uh, sort of ruling over a large area. And if you look at this map of Charlemagne's empire, you can see that he did oversee a rather large region, although not to the extent that we saw with Rome. Now what happened was, on Christmas Day in the year 800, Pope Leo III crowned Charles the Great, aka Charlemagne, as the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, or what later becomes the Holy Roman Empire, with some different territorial modifications. He was crowned by a saint he was crowned in St. Peter's Basilica, which was built by Constantine the first Roman Emperor to embrace Christianity. So let's think about this for a minute. We have an Emperor who's crowned on probably the most significant Christian religious holiday uh, by a Pope, and he's crowned in um, what is the most significant structure in all of Christendom, which was built by Constantine the first Christian Emperor of Rome. So do we think that we're going to be seeing a separation of church and state during the Carolingian period? If you guessed no, you are correct. No, there is no separation there. Now, the important thing that I want you to remember about Charlemagne is what his goal was for his reign in terms of his usage of art. Okay, He uses art in a political way, which is no different than pretty much any other ruler at any other time in history. What Charlemagne's goal was is he wanted to use art to kind of renew the uh, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was uh, characterized as being very grand, very powerful. He wanted to align himself with that level of grandiosity and power. But remember though we are looking at a Christian Emperor so the emulation is restricted to early Christian Rome. And it's a little bit of a, a fallacy here because we know that when Christianity emerges in Rome, this is coexisting with the decline of Rome. But uh, Charlemagne is not concerned with, with that. Uh, he's going back, he's looking to early Christian Rome. The other um, political entity that he returns to in addition to early Christian Rome is the Byzantine Empire. Now even though this isn't Rome, it still makes sense because this is another empire that's very large, very powerful, and importantly it is Christian. We saw that even in the Byzantine Empire there was no separation of church and state in that area as well. So we're going to be having our, our eyes open to look for um, indications in Carolingian art of a Roman influence or a Byzantine influence. And this is to again uh, renew the late Roman Empire. 
Okay, so let's take a look. We're going to start out with an equestrian portrait. Now this is the equestrian portrait of Charlemagne. Now some p scholars say that this actually is not Charlemagne, but it's his grandson Charles the Bald. Maybe, maybe not. We can't say for sure. It doesn't really matter. We can still kind of make the same conclusions if it's Charlemagne or if it's Charles the Bald. But let's go ahead and just stick with Charlemagne at this point um, because this is kind of an easier and more straightforward thing to do. Now if you look at the equestrian portrait of Charlemagne, we can see that it looks very similar to the equestrian portrait of Marcus Aurelius. Now is this a coincidence? This is not a coincidence, right? There are really no coincidences in art, at least in the ancient world. Um, there is an intentionality with the things that we see, and this is one of those. So we have this similarity, and we can clearly see that the Charlemagne portrait is based off of the portrait of Marcus Aurelius. Now I have a challenging question for you. Why would this similarity, why would using Marcus Aurelius's portrait be problematic? Take a minute, pause the video, think about this, right? And it's not, I'm going to give you a hint. It's not immediately apparent. And this is a hard question. That's your second hint. So pause it, think about it, and then come back. Now, when I pose this question to my students, a lot of students say things like, oh, there's a difference in the scale. We can see that the Charlemagne sculpture is smaller in size, nine and a half inches, that small scale typical of uh, the Middle Ages. Um, at least at this point, we do see some uh, larger uh, scale sculpture emerging a little later, but right now, small scale, it's typical. That's not the answer. Uh, the material is not the answer. Um, the uh, realism is not the answer. The answer, the reason why this is a problem is that you may recall, think about this, when in Rome's history was Marcus Aurelius Emperor of Rome? He was Emperor of Rome in the High Empire period. We do not see the um, legalization and adoption of Christianity until the 4th century, and that's with Constantine. So Marcus Aurelius was a pagan. So whoopsie, Charlemagne created his image in the guise of a pagan emperor. Now, why would he do such a thing? The answer to this question is it was a mistake. It was believed back in the Carolingian period that the equestrian portrait actually was an image of Constantine. So that was an error. So they were appropriating the image of the equestrian portrait based upon this error. Um, and if you think about it, then it fits in perfectly with Charlemagne's agenda because what he's trying to do is he's trying to emulate early Christ or, um, yeah, early Christian Rome. And so it would make sense he would have his image similar to Constantine. Now I just want to take this minute to uh, talk to you uh, about the superstars of the Middle Ages. That's what I call them. Since we're on the subject, the two superstars of the Middle Ages are Constantine, and he does not know it yet, but Charlemagne. We will see these figures as a presence in uh, medieval art throughout the entire Middle Ages. Two superstars, Charlemagne and Constantine. The reason why they're superstars is because they're seen as really using their political power to further the uh, power and the influence of the Christian church. So I'm just throwing that in there. Now, let's take a look and compare these two sculptures. So we see here that um, we have our bearded Marcus Aurelius, and we've talked at length about the beard. Now we see that Charlemagne's not bearded, but you do see that he has this lovely mustache, and the mustache is significant. In um, Frankish and Celtic conceptions, the mustache actually is a symbol of nobility. So we do have facial hair being used to represent masculine power. We see they both sit on their horse, and we see that the, uh, the legs are raised to show that the animal is in the process of walking. Now, if you look here, you can see, again, we have a manipulation of scale. You have uh, Charlemagne who is seated on this really tiny horse, and it's the, you know, is he on a tiny horse? Or is he on, um, you know, a regular size horse, and he is shown as larger in scale to indicate power, which is the same thing that's happening here with Marcus Aurelius. And that is likely the case. He's not walking around 
on a on a little Sebastian, right? A little teeny horse, but he actually is on a full size horse, uh, the size to show power. Marcus Aurelius has his hand extended, which we know can be a sign of speaking, or more likely, it's probably a gesture of mercy. Now here the arm is extended, we have the orb, which is to show global domination, that Charlemagne feels as though, because he is the boss of uh, you know, this large area of um, Europe, that he pretty much runs the world. A pretty bold claim, but we do know that this is typical of rulers to indicate uh, grandiose notions of power. Now, that pretty much, we can see the similarities. I think the glaring obvious uh, difference is the level of technical sophistication. Um, the equestrian portrait of Charlemagne, in terms of um, you know, its sophistication, it's pretty whatever. Uh, this is um, not the level of realism that we see in the Roman portrait here. Beautiful representation of drapery that's used to show the irregularity of cloth as it falls over the body, functioning to reveal the form and the, the volume of the body underneath. Uh, not the case here. He's kind of like awkwardly sort of like standing on the horse. He's very stiff. You have these kind of um, sort of cylindrical shapes that are used to sort of uh, create the form of the body, not a lot of detail in the representation of the form. Now this is highly typical of uh, the medieval period, which we kind of got this idea, think about the lumpy man in the, um, the, the manuscript that we saw in the uh, Saxon period lecture. Uh, to not really see technically sophisticated artwork. Um, and in this sense, art kind of takes a step backwards. A lot of people wonder why. Um, we do see that in the Middle Ages, there's not really a lot of investment that's being used in the training and the education of artists. Uh, artists primarily are clergy people, uh, people that have an artistic affinity, uh, and then they're just asked to um, create artwork. And so the other thing, too, to keep in mind is that we are seeing in the, the medieval period art that's really um, used in service of Christianity. These works of art, they're used to convey religious messages, or in this case, political, but it, you can say that it's, it's kind of the same. Then they convey religious messages, and that's the first and foremost function of the artwork. The art as an object really is a vessel, vessel to communicate these ideas, and therefore it doesn't receive kind of the care and the attention that we've seen in art produced in earlier periods. And this explains why we don't see the level of quality that we have been um, sort of accustomed to seeing when we are looking at the classical world. Now here we have another example. Um, this is the front cover of a uh, religious text, an illuminated manuscript. Um, we saw when we looked at the Saxon period last uh, lecture that they were very accomplished metal workers. This does extend into the Carolingian period and that there is a taste for small scale, uh, very expensive works of art that are using very beautiful and valuable materials. Uh, we see this primarily um, with the use of gold, with the use of semi-precious stones, and then also with very fine craftsmanship. This was seen in the Saxon period. You can see with this cover um, here that this extends into the Carolingian period. Now, um, here we have with the fine materials, this is used to reflect the beauty and the richness of the words of God that are contained within the book. This is a very grand book cover. The size is over one foot in height, very richly adorned. Um, and remember that, um, you know, I said this in the last lecture, that these books were like treasures. And here you really have treasure in the more literal sense with the use of these types of materials. Now in the center of the uh, composition here, we have an image of the crucifixion. This is a typical theme for medieval book covers. And the type of crucifixion that we can see here is a peaceful and serene type. There are two types of, Christ or of crucifixion images. This type here, where Jesus kind of looks like he's sleeping and floating, and then you also have the kind of more realistic one where he is shown in pain and in suffering, which is what you would anticipate uh, when you are thinking about the realities of going through the kind of torture uh, that Jesus had to endure as part of his crucifixion. 
So here is kind of the sort of otherworldly approach. Jesus has transcended the very human suffering that's involved with death. It's kind of um, emphasizing his more supernatural qualities. So we see it here. We also see here, it's very interesting that Jesus is shown as young and bearded. And this is a little bit different because we know that ever since the, the Byzantine period, the more typical representation is of grumpy bearded Jesus. Um, here though, he's the young unbearded Jesus. So a little different uh, choice. Now you can see that he's surrounded by figures. These two figures here are believed to be representations of the sun and the moon. We have this beautiful crescent here to uh, further um, support that interpretation. These here are um, grieving angels. Uh, right in here we've got Mary and we've got St. John. And these figures, their identity is unknown. They perhaps could be saints. They could even be the patrons, the people who paid for the creation of this uh, very gorgeous book cover. Now let's talk about the Palatine Chapel of Charlemagne. So um, what happened is, is when Charlemagne came into power, he established his capital at the uh, city of Aachen, Germany. He built um, a, a palace that had all sorts of functions beyond simply uh, residential and the administration of political power. Now there is a religious function to his palace in that he included as one of these sort of auxiliary structures this chapel. And this chapel functioned as his personal place of worship. It also was the place where the imperial court worshipped, and then when he died, this would also be the mausoleum for, um, for Charlemagne as well. I do also want to point out that after the, um, Charlemagne uh, passed away, this was also the coronation site for Otto I, who's the first um, emperor of the Etonian period, the third of the sub-periods of the early Middle Ages, the next uh, lecture that's in this series. This also was the coronation site for other emperors for about 30 years um, after Otto I. So this was an important political site um, in addition to being a religious site as well. Now, we know that the agenda of Charlemagne is to look back to the imperial past of early Christian Rome as well as the Byzantine period. Now, my question to you is, can you tell what structure Charlemagne is um, influenced by in the design of this chapel? So think about it, pause the video, and come back. Now, if you guessed San Vitale, you would be correct. Um, what we're seeing here, okay, and this should be the big giveaway, okay, and if not, note this. This is a good cheat for your final exam. What gives it away are the angled walls. Remember that San Vitale, uh, what is unique about it is that it's a centrally planned structure that has a rather complex floor plan that consists of intersecting ovals and octagons. If you ever see sloped walls, okay, think San Vitale, okay, it's a structure that's going to be either San Vitale or a structure influenced by San Vitale. So you can see the kind of like faceted uh, angling of the walls, that's indicative of San Vitale. The other thing that is indicative of San Vitale, which you don't know that, you wouldn't know this, so I'm going to point this out, is the use of material. You can see in here that there's a use of purple marble. The purple marble actually comes from Ravenna, and it is the location where San Vitale um, was built. So this is evocative of San Vitale through the uh, faceted walls, the design, as well as the incorporation of the material as well. Now there's one other thing about this structure that I want to talk about. And I want to talk about this because this is another link that this structure has with San Vitale. Remember in San Vitale we looked at the apse, right? And we looked at the Jesus um, mosaic here at the center. We had the Justinian mosaic and the Theodora mosaic here. Just keep this in mind. Remember this. Now I want to show you this. This right here is the throne. The throne of Charlemagne that he would sit on when he was in church. Now that alone is interesting. The idea that he's enthroned that his uh, sort of royal status is emphasized while he is practicing his religion. This throne is made of marble and this throne is located on the second level. Okay, we can see that we have the levels here. It's on the second level. 
and <clears throat> the throne is located directly across from the um, the the uh, apse, okay, which we know is the most important part of the church. There is a, um, a mosaic in this um, structure, okay, above the altar, Jesus. And so what's happening, think about the spatial relationship. First of all, Charlemagne is sitting elevated above everybody else. Okay, so that's one thing. Second thing is that he, um, and that's to show his power. The second thing is that he's located directly across from this Jesus mosaic. And so what's happening is, is like on a spatial level, they're equal to one another directly across which allows for the people to make this sort of affiliation between Jesus and um, Charlemagne. And remember, if I can go back for a moment, that that's what Justinian was doing by placing himself in this mosaic right here. So through spatial positioning, there's this association between Jesus and um, Charlemagne. It's a way to underscore Charlemagne's power. The other thing is you'll notice there's these windows behind here. What would happen is, is people like us, okay, everyday people, we were not permitted to go in here. We were not permitted to use this space as a place of, of um, religious worship, only the privileged. But what we could do is we could stand outside. And when you stand outside and when you look through the window, you actually could see Charlemagne sitting in this throne. And so you were able to view the ruler as the ruler is practicing their religion. Now, this is also something that we saw in other religious structures, namely, um, in the mosque when we were looking at the Moksura and how the Moksura is placed in front of the Mirab, this highly visible place where people would be able to look at the ruler as they are practicing their religion. And the same thing's happening here. The motivation behind this is it helps to sort of ingratiate uh, the, the ruler uh, within the good graces of the, of the people. It also is a way for the ruler to get trust, right? Like, oh, um, Charlemagne can do whatever he wants. I'm not going to question it because clearly, uh, you know, he would never involve himself in anything corrupt or unethical because clearly he is a religious man. And I do know that because I've watched him actually worship. Now, this is not to say that these uh, rulers were or were not you know, corrupt or unethical, but it certainly helped to kind of um, communicate to their people that they were not corrupt or unethical. And we'll finish up by taking a look at the structure here, which features a very important part, important um, addition to church architecture, and that is the West work. Now, again, we know that um, the goal of Charlemagne is to continue on with the artistic traditions of early Christian Rome as well as the Byzantine Empire. Now this includes perpetuating the common architectural plans that were established in early Christian Rome. Recall that those three plans are the uh, Basilica plan, because remember the Latin cross plan isn't really, um, you know, the Latin cross plan, but it's not commonly used until the Romanesque period. Basilica plan, the Latin cross plan, the central plan. So here we have the Basilica plan, right? So they're perpetuating that, but what they begin to do is they begin to incorporate new additions. And the new addition that's incorporated is the West work, which are the towers that you see here. Now they're called West work because they're oriented to the West. Church entrances typically are facing the West because that is the direction that Jesus was facing when he was crucified. So essentially the West work are there to establish a very dramatic entry point to the church. Now I want you to just keep this on your radar to think about this idea of a dramatic entry point because this is something that um, architects and artists are thinking more and more about. We've already talked about the idea that the interior of the church is used to really heighten the experience, right? Remember the Hagia Sophia, the gold that shines down like golden rays of light as it reflects off of the mosaics and the paint. Now they're taking it to the outside. So this idea that you have dramatic exterior to sort of prime the viewer, get them ready as they walk up to this structure, it sort of dwarfs them. The size is awe-inspiring, inspiring, and it certainly um, 
speaks to the power of God. And so the, the people kind of get that in their mind and then they have that as they enter in. Now you'll notice that otherwise it's very plain. This is going to change when we get into the late Middle Ages where artists really begin to exploit the um, possibilities of communication by embellishing the doorway, which is known as the portal, and then also the inclusion of all types of sculpture and other fancy things as well. So this is one of the things about the West work, right, that it kind of creates this dramatic point of entry. Now I want to think to more about this though. Basically what we have are these two tall towers, right? Think about maybe some other tall towers associated with religious architecture that we've seen. If you're thinking about the minarets, you're on the right track. The minarets of the Islamic mosque. It's the same thing. They were tall and they were used to, um, for the minarets, mark the presence of Islam in a city. Here it marks the presence of Christianity. What is an also an interesting link between the minaret and uh, the West work is the fact that in the West work they include bells. So when it's time to come to church, when it's time to pray, the bells ring. And so we also have this reminder of religious worship that is being encouraged through sound, which we know also is the case with the West work, or excuse me, with the minaret of the Islamic Mosque.